Good morning, everyone. Grace and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ to you this morning. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back with you. If you don't know who I am, my name is Peter, and I'm one of the pastors here at Bradfield and Ruffham Baptist Church. People call us BRBC, and we are a church that's all about loving Jesus together and helping others to do the same. We're so glad to have you this morning. A few things just to be aware of as we start our service. The first is a reminder that Ladies Bible Study has begun again, and that's uh, every Friday during term time at 9.15 over Zoom. Any lady is more than welcome to join. They're studying through the book of Philippians right now. So if you'd like more information on that, you can find that link down in the description below. I encourage you to go along to that. Again, that's Friday mornings at 9.15, the Ladies Bible Study. Secondly, many of you will know that most of us are watching online right now, but some of us are going to be meeting in person for our first in-person service today, right now at uh, our church building. Now, if you weren't able to sign up for this week and you'd still like to, please do sign up to come along. We send out an email on Monday uh, evenings at 7.30 where you can sign up to come along. We would love to have you in person for our services on Sundays. And there'll be more developments coming as we continue on into September and into October. And we'll keep you updated with that. But now as we come to our service, we come to worship the real, the true living God who made the heavens and the earth. We're going to cast our minds to Psalm 47. And Psalm 47 really is this praise uh, psalm to God who is enthroned above it all. And it says this. From Psalm 47, God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. So we're going to do that right now. We're going to sing together. We're going to sing, crown him with many crowns. Let's sing together.
crown him the Lord of years, the potentate of time, creator of the rolling spheres, ineffably sublime, all hail Thou hast died for me Thy praise shall never, never fail Throughout eternity Well, thanks for singing along with us. We now come to a part of our service we call the Kids Talk, which is a time which we get to all learn something together as a whole church family. And today we are starting a new series called Amazing Jesus to find out what it is that really makes Jesus so amazing. So Sam's gonna kick us off into this new series. So let's tune in and watch the first installment in Amazing Jesus. Hello everyone and hello children. Now I hope you're all settled back in at school okay after the rather long summer break. Now today we're starting our awesome new theme for kids talks called Amazing Jesus. So this morning we're going to learn how we know that Jesus is God's son. Now I have four fabulous daughters and most of you know them all. There's Ellie, who's 20, Lottie, who's 14, Millie, who's 12, and little Hope, who is one next week. Now, they are all my daughters. Now, Jesus is God's son, and God is Jesus' father. But we'll come back to that in a minute or two. So, first this week, it's quiz time. Now... It's a tough one this week. You've got to guess what some of these things are that I'm holding up. It's a bit of a tough one, so uh, you might need the help of some adults, but just shout out once you know the answer. Right, the first thing is this. Shout out the answers, did I hear anything? Yes, it's a teddy bear. Oh, I love this cuddly teddy bear. It's so cute and cuddly and soft, and I can chat to him. Hello, Teddy. Ah, oh, I love this teddy bear. Right, good. So if you got that right, it's one point. Right, on to the second one. All right, here's the second one. Yep, yeah. everyone guess what this is. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I heard it. Sunglasses. They're fantastic, these sunglasses. They've even got my name on. So I know they're mine and I can put them on. Yep, yeah, to stop the sun. They're amazing. Right, two out of two, anybody? No? Oh, well, yeah, they're not really, are they? Now, you all know this isn't a teddy bear, is it? It's one of the girls' netballs. But this is a teddy bear. This is Fat Bear. This is Fat Bear, he's awesome. It's actually Ellie's. I'm not meant to tell you, but he is. Now, we know he's cuddly, isn't he? And lovely and soft. He's exactly what a bear should be. Soft and cuddly and cute, and you can chat to him. He's cool, isn't he? And the next one is, these are my sunglasses. Not this, is it? So, we know these are sunglasses because they fit well, they keep the sun off, and they make me look really cool. Which is great, isn't it? So, now, to Jesus. How do we know from the Bible that Jesus is God's son? Well, just like we know what the bear is, we know it's a teddy bear from the shape of it and what it does, and it's great to cuddle. And we know these are sunglasses because they're great when we put them on and they do the job and keep the sun off. So, how do we know from the Bible that Jesus is God's son? 
Well, just like we know that the bear and the sunglasses, what they are by the things that they do, we know Jesus is God's son because of what he does in the Bible. We can tell by all the great things that he done, the miracles he performed, bringing people back to life, healing people, feeding people, helping the blind to see. Jesus showed God's power in all of these things. He really proved that to have this power, he must be God's son. Now, I want you to remember that the power of Jesus, the power that he had in him through God, is there for us if we ask God to come into our lives. So remember, amazing Jesus is God's son. Bye, everybody. Well, what a truth to remember this morning, that Jesus is God's son. And because of Jesus' work on the cross, he has included us into God's family. And so that relationship between Jesus and the Father is now our relationship with us and the Father. And so we get to come before our heavenly Father. We get to lay before him all of our burdens, all of our needs and requests, and we get to come to him. And so we're going to do that right now. We're going to come and pray before our heavenly Father. So I want to ask you to join me. Would you pray with me? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for this morning, which we can gather together virtually here in Bury St. Edmunds and across the world, Lord. And Lord, we just pray for all those who are listening to this message, Lord, who are feeling down and discouraged and uh, lonely and isolated from COVID, Lord. And uh, we just pray that you would just lift up their heads, encourage them, and strengthen them, Lord, through this uh through this message and through the, the worship today and through the preaching of your word, Lord, and to remind them that they're not alone, that you're here for them. And I pray that for our church, Lord, that that you would just continue to show us ways in which we can be a light to those around us, to, to our communities, to our families, to our friends, Lord. And I pray for the preaching of the, your word this morning, Lord, as James gives his message to us, that you would just give them the right words to say that would touch our hearts and um, help us to just to understand how to live out our lives, Lord, in a way that would be uh, honoring and pleasing to you, Lord. And we just uh, thank you so much for who you are, Lord, and uh, for your goodness and for your faithfulness to us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for praying along with us. Now today we are continuing on in the story of Esther. And today we come to Esther chapter 8. And we're going to continue on into that story. It's a big reading, but it's a really fascinating one as well. So we're going to read from chapter 8, 1 to verse 9, 16. And then I'll hand it over to James to walk us through that. So again, that's Esther chapter 8, verse 1 to chapter 9, verse 16. Here we go. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, Esther rose and stood before the king. And she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, and if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews, who are in all the provinces of the king." For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you pl please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king, and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. 
The king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day, and an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded concerning the Jews, to the satraps and the governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces, to each province in its own script, to each people in its own language, and also to the Jews in their script and their language. And he wrote in the name of the king Ahasuerus and sealed it with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud, saying that the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, children and women included, and to plunder their goods. On one day throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus, on the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. A copy of what was written was to be issued as a decree in every province, being publicly displayed to all peoples. And the Jews were ready on that day to take vengeance on their enemies. So the couriers mounted on their swift horses that were used in the king's service, rode out hurriedly, urged by the king's command, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel. Then Mordecai went out from the presence of the king in royal robes of blue and white, with a great golden crown and a robe of fine linen and purple. And the city of Susa shouted and rejoiced. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor. And in every province, in every city, wherever the king's command and his edict reached, there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for the fear of the Jews had fallen on them. Now, in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar, on the thirteenth day of the same, when the king's command and edict were about to be carried out, on the very day when the enemies of Jews hoped to gain the mastery over them, the reverse occurred. The Jews gained mastery over those who hated them. The Jews gathered in their cities throughout all the provinces of King Ahasuerus to lay hands on those who sought their harm. And no one could stand against them, for the fear of them had fallen on all peoples, all the officials of the provinces and the satraps and the governors and the royal agents also helped the Jews, for the fear of Mordecai had fallen on them. For Mordecai was great in the king's house, and his fame spread throughout all the provinces, for the man Mordecai grew more and more powerful. The Jews struck all their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa, the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men, and also killed Parashandatha, Dalphon, Aspatha, Poratha, Adalia, Aridathia, Parmastha, Arsai, Ardai, Vaistha, and the ten sons of Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. But they laid no hand on the plunder. That very day, the number of those killed in Susa, the citadel, was reported to the king. And the king said to Queen Esther, in Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and also the 10 sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. And Esther said, if it please the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow also to do according to this day's edict. And let the 10 sons of Haman be hanged on the gallows. So the king commanded this to be done. A decree was issued in Susa, and the ten sons of Haman were hanged. The Jews who were in Susa gathered also on the fourteenth day of the month of Adar and killed three hundred men in Susa, but they laid no hands on the plunder. Now the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed seventy-five thousand of those who hated them, but they laid no hands on the plunder. This was on the thirteenth day of the month of Adar, and on the fourteenth day they rested and made that day a feast of gladness. But the Jews who were in Susa gathered on the thirteenth day and on the fourteenth, and rested on the fifteenth, making that day a day of feasting and of gladness. Therefore the Jews of the villages who live in the rural towns hold the fourteenth day of the month of Adar as a day of gladness and feasting, as a holiday, and as a day on which they send gifts to food, of food to one another. I'm going to hand it over to James. Now let's listen in. 
Do you ever have the mo- you know, those moments in life when you realize it's not over yet? Perhaps it was watching one of your favorite sports teams. It's five minutes from the end and you decide to leave the stadium because they're not winning, turn the TV off, they're losing, only to find out the next day in the news that they had scored two goals or more points and won the game after you left or turned off because it wasn't over yet. What about, what about Brexit negotiations? Doesn't it feel like they've been going on forever and this still doesn't seem to be dealt with? It's not over yet. I remember in the beginning of April this year, thinking ahead to the impact COVID-19 was going to have on the world and saying to, saying to Quincy at home, well, I think by, by July, we'll be finished with this. <laughs> We're staring down the barrel of October now and it's not over yet. What about a film with an unsatisfying finish? Well, well, that was rubbish. That's not the resolution I needed. It's not over yet. What about the child who comes back to live at home after uni? An illness that keeps coming back. It's not over yet. You know, there's plenty of times in life where we find ourselves saying that. We're not done with this. It's not finished. It's not over yet. Well, this morning, as we look at these, begin to look at these final chapters in Esther, it's a place where people normally stop the story at the end of chapter 7, thinking that the story is finished. But chapter 8, 9, and 10 end up getting left behind. Now this is probably because people look at these latter chapters of Esther and just kind of think, this does seem messy. And, And maybe we think to ourselves, well, we don't really know what to do with this, so, so let's just turn the page and, and carry on reading the rest of the Bible. But here's what we need to know at the end of chapter 7. The story is far from over. We haven't had a resolution yet. It's not over yet. Now, now so far in Esther, we've seen Esther's rise to royalty. She's queen of the Persian Empire. But remember, Esther, along with Uncle Mordecai, are Jews living in Susa, far from, a hundred miles, hundreds of miles away from their ancestral homeland. But because of the manipulative, pride-filled scheming of that evil Haman, there is now an edict irrevocably etched into law that the Jews will be killed. And it's set in stone. Now, Esther has gone before the king, you remember that, and and enacted her cryptic plan, plan A, Esther's plan A. And her plan had resulted in the death of Haman, and, and we saw that last week, didn't we? But here's something key for us today. We cannot let Haman's death lead us into a false sense of security here, because there is still a massive problem in this story, and it's the reason it's not over yet. Though Haman is gone, the edict, the decree against the Jews that spells out their demise is still here. So, is that it for them? There's just this unavoidable shadow hanging over them? There's that tsunami on the horizon quickly racing towards them? God's people are tied to the tracks and they can hear the freight train of Haman's law hurtling round the corner. Is that it? Well, this story is not finished. Now, now this next, in these next few, few chapters are, are chaotic and hard to think through. But we do see a solution to the looming tragedy begin, begin to emerge. We find something, something seemingly impossible This situation isn't as hopeless as we might think. So the big question we ask as we come to studying this next chunk of Esther is, well, are God's people actually going to be rescued? We've been asking that for a few chapters now, but is it going to happen? And if so, how is this rescue going to come about? How? How how will they be rescued? Now, here's how we'll map this out this morning. We're, we're going to set this out in three parts. We'll see Esther's passionate and emotional plea before the king. Then secondly, we'll see Mordecai's genius brainwave. And then we'll see 
some serious self-defense. That's how this unfolds. And then what we'll do is we'll bring this down to earth in our lives and see how it meets us. So let's jump into this. Firstly, part one, Esther's plea. Esther's plea. Now, before we jump into beginning to see what her plea looks like, let's have a look at the first couple of verses of chapter 8. We'll see kind of the culmination of the grand reversal that's been emerging over the last two chapters, where, where Haman and Mordecai seem to swap places. Look at this. On that day, King Ahasuerus gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told, had told what he was to her. And the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. Now at this point, it seems great, doesn't it? Haman is gone, big cheer, we love this. That antagonistic, angry descendant of Agag, Haman the hater, is done and he's no more. I mean, can we just soak up the ha happily ever after moment, please? Well, well no. Because there's a problem. Esther's original plan, her plan A, hasn't completely saved the day. Remember how plan A worked. She, she'd gone before the king, risking her life in so doing, and then to get king and his right-hand man, Haman, to go along to two feasts. And by the end of those two feasts, Haman is dead and gone. But there's the huge problem. The king ratified, Haman-led edict to slaughter the Jews is still in place. Now, here's what we might think at this point. Well, that doesn't seem like a big problem, does it? I mean, it's really simple. Haman's gone. Can't Esther just go to the king and get everything reversed? I mean, he's the king, after all. No Haman, no law easy. And besides, the king has been pretty accommodating to her so far. I wonder if you've ever had those moments when something that seemed so simple suddenly becomes impossibly complex. You know, maybe it was a situation at work. It just seemed like A to B, but all of a sudden turns into a bowl of spaghetti. Or, or, or maybe it was some conversation that seemed simple you needed to have with someone but the ripples into other relationships man it just got complex what about having children before having kids there's a wonderful wonderful view of what it would be like I can remember it and it's natural to think so I remember thinking well it's going to be serene I'll be energized I'll be in complete control and then it happened <laughs> and I realized that something that seemed so simple suddenly was far more complex than I could have imagined and I was way out of my depth ever felt that before it seemed simple but it then feels suddenly complex well that's Esther she thinks that that, that reversing Haman's planned killing spree will be easy but she finds the opposite is true. Have, have a look at verse 3 here. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman the Agagite and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. That's an amazing moment here. Esther in this story has been calm and collected. She's been as cool as a cucumber. She's she, it's, it's as though she's had everyone in the palm of her hands as she's organizing and strategizing, but this is so different. She's emotional. She's passionate. There's almost a frenzied feel to this. Please! She weeps at the king's feet. But the king gives her another welcome, raises his scepter. That's good news again. She's not going to die. But here comes Esther's request in verse 5. And she said, If it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight... And if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing in his eyes, let an order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all of the provinces of the king. King, can you please just write something that undoes Haman's edict? Can we just do away with this, please? But like I say, it seemed simple. But it's not that simple. Look at verses 7 and 8. 
Then King Ahasuerus said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king and seal it with the king's ring. For an edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Here's what the king has just said. Look, look at what I've already done for you guys. But know this, Esther and Mordecai. And here's the kicker. I can't just undo anything that's been written into law. Did you hear that? Any of the king's decrees cannot be reversed. You know, maybe think back to the story of Daniel. How Daniel kind of rises to a position of influence. The king really, really likes Daniel. But then there's those who conspire against Daniel and put a law in place, manipulating the king to, get, to, 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 to say, everybody has to pray to you, king. And then, of course, they frame Daniel because they know Daniel is praying to his God. And then the king is stuck because he has to punish Daniel. And you remember how, how the king was sleepless that night and how the king dashed down the next morning after Daniel had been thrown to the lions and cried out, Daniel, has your God saved you? You see, in that story, we see that even though he's the king, he cannot just reverse something that has been sealed into law. But, but notice something the king also says here. Take my ring, the one that's used for ratifying the laws, for sealing them and write another law. Whatever you want, Esther and Mordecai, whatever you think will help you, you, can, you, can un you can't undo what's been written, but you can write something else. Do you feel the dilemma as this as a reader? I mean, we find ourselves asking, well, what, what can they do? How will Esther and Mordecai respond? They've got to write something, but but what can they do against such a violent and bloody decree from Haman? Well, there's something that can be done. Mordecai takes this situation by the scruff of the neck. Part two, Mordecai's genius. So, so Mordecai, we read here, collects scribes together and everything he says, they write. And they, they write in every language of the empire, which, remember, stretches from Egypt all the way to India. And then via some kind of Persian Pony Express, the messages are delivered. But here's what the message says. And here is the genius of it all. Verse 11. Saying the king allowed the Jews who were in every city to gather and defend their lives, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate any armed force of any people or province that might attack them, women and children included, and to plunder their goods. You see that? So, so, so to anyone who attacks the Jews, the Jews can respond within, with an aggressive self-defense on the day that they are going to be attacked by those who stand with Haman's hating. I mean, we've read these words before, haven't we? To destroy, to kill to annihilate, women and children included. We've, we've heard that before. Well, that's, that's a like for like, because that's exactly what Haman had said. I mean, follow the story here. The king's laws stand, but Mordecai, Mordecai's clever response is to allow the Jews to do exactly to their attackers what was planned against them. Now, they now... They don't have to sit idly by, but they can now aggressively stand up for themselves. And in this, everyone in the entire empire is to know that the Jews can respond with some serious self-defense. And this goes around the empire. I love how one scholar imagines the scene here. He writes this, Put yourself in the shoes of an ambitious lieutenant, lieutenant governor, say Turkmenistan, which would be in the empire. Several months ago, you received an official letter of state bearing the king's seal and, le and legislating the murder of all the Jews in your province on a single blood-soaked day. Since then, you've been gearing up for the occasion, putting local anti-Semites in touch with one another, lending office space to militia, deregulating the small arms market, you name it. And then one fine day, a royal messenger 
shows up at the governor's mansion with another letter of state. You open it, only to find that it is a decree in favor of the Jews. The Jews are being given the right to defend themselves during the very day of killing for which you have been so assiduously preparing. So it's the second edict has been published, and it's out there. Now, the, th the next thing, after sending this out, that Mordecai does initially seems, seems really strange and really weird. But here's what I think is going, going on here. Mordecai leaves the king's presence dressed in royal clothes, wearing a crown and a robe. And there's this parade in the city. And, and, and then in, in the city of Susa, there is this celebration amongst the Jews. There's this joyous celebration and glad feasting, and it spreads throughout Jewish communities and households in the rest of the empire. I just kind of think, what is going on? How can we connect the dots here? Aren't they supposed to be preparing for that serious self-defense? And here they are celebrating and feasting. What's happening? Well, follow this. Follow this. Because verse 17, or at least right at the end of it in chapter 8, kind of gives us a window into why this is happening. Look at this, the second half. And there was gladness and joy among the Jews, a feast and a holiday. And many from the peoples of the country declared themselves Jews, for fear of the Jews had fallen upon them. So hang on a second. The result of the celebration and Mordecai's parade is the fear of others. Do you see that? Mordecai's flamboyant royal parade is, I think, Mordecai's psychological warfare. Genius. Think about how um, boxers before they fight one another, talk to each other, right? You know, particularly one of those multi-hundreds of million pound fights and seems like a good proportion of the world's population tunes into them. In the lead up to this, there'll be loads of media coverage. There will be the weigh-ins, there will be the interviews. Uh, and then the whole time, these boxers are speaking, speaking pretty vulgar to one another. But, but the way they're speaking is though they've already won. And you know, when it comes to the fight, there's the ring entries and they try to outdo one another, surrounded by their henchmen as they go. And there's lights, there's smoke, and, and, it's, and, it, and it looks like a victory parade. Now, why are they acting like this? Why are they doing like this? Well, they, they're acting like they have won before they've even won. They're intimidating their opponents. They're trying to make their opponents second guess their own abilities. They're acting like they've won before they've even won. Mordecai is doing the same thing here. Acting like they've won before they have even won. The same scholar continues to imagine the scene. It goes like this. For if you were that lieutenant, lieutenant governor in Turkmenistan, and you were weighing which of the two conflicting degrees, decrees in your hands represented the true position of the palace. What message would you take from the sudden news that the Jews are celebrating in Susa? And Mordecai is parading through the streets in royal robes. I mean, it's seriously intimidating to hear about this celebration if you're supposed to be fighting against the Jews. And, and think about this. Add to the fact that this empire doesn't do social media to propagate the news instantaneously. Imagine being in the empire and you hear that the Jews are celebrating in Susa and Mordecai is wearing what? Oh no, we'd better join these people. Can you see the genius in Mordecai's move here? He seems to be giving his people every chance he possibly can for them to make it through Haman's edict, his irrevocable edict, and survive. Now, what happens next? How does this all turn out? Part three some serious self-defense. Now this next section in chapter nine is brutal. It's messy, it's bloody, it's, it's hard to handle and probably the reason why so many people just tend to turn the page and finish Esther early. But here's two things we need to keep in mind as we look at this. Firstly, though many people had already joined the Jews, there were still loads of people ready to kill them. 
and those are the ones who are killed. So it's not a random attack on the inhabitants of the Persian Empire. It's an aggressive move to kill those who would have otherwise killed them. Maybe you could call it an act of preemptive self-defense. The second thing we need to know, the Jews go from being unjustly condemned to freed and liberated. Haman's edict was unreasonable, but Mordecai's edict in God's providence allowed for an overarching justice. Look at verses 5 and 6 with me here. The Jews struck all of their enemies with the sword, killing and destroying them, and as they as and did as they pleased to those who hated them. In Susa the citadel itself, the Jews killed and destroyed 500 men. So they killed 500 men in Susa, and they also ended up killing the 10 sons of Haman. Now the king then comes to Esther, verses 12 and 13 here. And the king said to Queen Esther, In Susa the citadel, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men, and also the ten sons of Haman. What then have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is your wish? It shall be granted to you. And what further is your request? It shall be fulfilled. Now, Esther goes ahead and she asks for one more day. And Esther said, if it pleases the king, let the Jews who are in Susa be allowed tomorrow to to also to do according to this day's edict. Now, why does she ask for one more day? We guess that she has had some more intel that there is more aggressors in the city. The job is not quite finished yet, so the king lets it go ahead for another day. And in verse 16, we read something of the scale of the situation. Now, the rest of the Jews who were in the king's provinces also gathered to defend their lives and got relief from their enemies and killed 75,000 of those who hated them, but laid no hands on their plunder. Now, now one last important thing about this scene. There is this constant phrase. You can just see it as you read through this. Scan your eyes. But they did not lay hands on the plunder. I mean, why is that repeated so many times? Why is that such a big deal that they didn't take any spoils of this strong armed self-defense? Well, the author wants us to see something. Way way back in 1 Samuel chapter 15, King Saul had fought King Agag, the king of the arch enemy, the Canaanites. But King Saul had both failed to kill Agag and ended up taking plunder that he wasn't supposed to. Now remember, Haman, the villain in this story, was an Agagite, a descendant of that Canaanite king. So this time, what went wrong before goes right. Haman is gone and no plunder is taken. So we emerge on the the other side of this messy scene. Jews celebrating. The clouds seem to finally part in this story. The sun seems to shine through. And this brutal scene finishes with the realization that the Jews are now safe. They celebrate. It's a big celebration. It's relief. It's something to remember. It's something to go down in the history books. God's people are alive. And it's happening in a way that no one could have predicted. God's people are finally now safe, free, rescued from Haman's evil plot. Plan A got Haman dealt with. Plan B and Mordecai's genius resulted in God's people really being saved. Now, now as this chaotic scene, it it seems as if there is an important picture being painted through it. Now, follow me here. In Esther chapter 7 and chapter 8, there is this unreasonable, hateful enemy against God's people. That enemy is defeated, but his evil schemes remain until a savior character comes along with a plan to finish the victory that has already been put in motion. Those who stood against God's people and stood against God received the consequences of that. But God's people are kept safe through the dark days and are brought to a place of victory. Now, what I've just said in the last few sentences sounds very familiar to us. Let me repeat those. There is an unreasonable and hateful enemy against God's people. But we know that enemy has been defeated. 
but his evil schemes remain until a saviour comes to finish the victory that has already been put in motion. I'll continue. One day, those who stand against God's people and against God will receive the consequences of their hostility. But God's people will be kept safe through these dark days and will be brought to a place of victory. told you it sounds familiar, doesn't it? And we live in that same space between Esther 7 uh, and Esther 8. When we know an enemy has been defeated and we look forward to a victory that's coming. For us, we're in view of the cross where the enemy with all of his unhinged delusion has been defeated. But we still await the fullness of Jesus' victory when he comes back to bring his renewal and his perfect judgment. We stand in this space where we can say it is not over yet. There is more to come. There is another vital event in history when Jesus comes back. Now let me bring this down to earth to us in two ways. Firstly, to those, to those of you who don't count yourself in Jesus today, message to you, it's not over yet. You know, one day Jesus will return and he will come to judge the living and the dead. As the Apostles' Creed says, his judgment will be perfect and true and global and history spanning. He will deal with everything, everything from government ordained horrors to the hurts between people. He will unveil the thoughts and hidden offenses of all. But that same exposing light will be shone on everyone. And unless we are in Jesus, we face the punishment for that. You notice in this scene in Esther, there is no neutral ground. And and the same is true of us. You might be thinking to yourself, well, well, I'm not hostile towards the people like Haman's side are. Well, here's the thing. If, If you're not in Christ, then in the very posture of your heart, you are against him. If you're not someone who's trusted in him alone, gone to him for grace and mercy, then you are not with him. You need to know, you can go to Jesus today. Here's some good news. It's not over yet. Because you can go to the cross. You can go to Jesus. And you can find the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy and the rest that your soul is so thirsty for. Secondly, Those who are counted amongst his people. It's the same message for you. It's not over yet. God will rescue his people fully and finally one day. When Jesus comes, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death right now, there is a mountain on the other side where there is no more shadows. Imagine being one of the Jews in the empire when the battle is won. And you're standing in the hot Persian sun, realizing that the heartache and the sleepless nights are over. The black clouds of threat are parted and you can finally rest. How good would that have felt? Imagine the relief. Well, for those in Christ, a relief is coming. Now, unlike the Jews in Susa, we're not left wondering what's going to happen, whether or not we will be rescued. No, we have a concrete confidence And as the people of Jesus, we spend our lives assuredly longing for that hopeful horizon of Jesus' return, knowing that God's final rescue will come and our ships will gladly run aground on the shores of a new creation. Maybe you need to hear that today. Maybe you need to hear that it's not over yet. Maybe you need to hear that one day this shadow will lift. And Jesus will dwell with his people. You know, in the heartache, in the heartbreak, in the crushing health complaints, in the threats of disease, in the menace of poor mental health, fractured friendships, ruptured relationships, can I tell you something? It's it's not over yet. Jesus will come back. He will bring his victory in all of its fullness. And we look forward to that. But today we say, it's not over yet. 
So this morning we have explored a chapter and a half <laughs> that has both messiness and genius, threat and ingenuity. But where something seemingly hopeless is reversed into an unexpected victory. But deeper than that, we can see that we too live in the hope that God will unexpectedly move to rescue and save his people. And with that wonderful truth in Jesus, that Jesus has done it and Jesus will finish it. So may we live with a confident hope and rooted expectation, knowing that Jesus will return to bring about his final rescue. Because we know that it's not over yet. Now this week, I'm going to pray. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Esther story. We thank you that you have worked in and through the seeming coincidences, through Esther's bravery, Mordecai's genius to save your people. And today, we ask that you would fill us with a hope to know that though the enemy is defeated, we too will experience your rescue when Jesus returns. So we pray you would help us to live with that confident, concrete expectation. Fill us with that assurance. And in the dark days and under the shadows, that we know the light will one day shine and we will stand in that renewal of Jesus. Fill us with that hope today. And we're praying in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we now get to respond by singing. And we get to sing a song that's very fitting called You Alone Can Rescue. So let's sing together. save themselves and their own soul could heal our shame was deeper than the sea your grace is deeper still who oh Lord could save themselves their own soul could heal our shame was deeper than the sea your grace is deeper still you alone can rescue you alone can save you alone can lift us from the grave you came down to find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise you oh lord have made a way the grave divide you healed for when our hearts were far away your love went further still yes your love goes further still and you alone can rescue you alone can save you alone can lift us from the grave you came down to find us let us out of death to you alone belongs the highest praise to you alone belongs the highest praise Lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. We 
Lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. Lift up our eyes, lift up our eyes, you're the giver of life. You alone can rescue, you alone can save, you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise. To you alone belongs the highest praise. Well, it's been so good to be with you again this Sunday. Uh, we would love to see you at the prayer night this evening when we as a whole church come together and pray over Zoom. But if we can't see you then, we look forward to the next time we get to meet together. Until that, may we hear these words from Paul in the book of Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go in peace, saints.